What's going on? This is Marcus Martinez, Carol King's poster boy. <laughs> Uh, that was our conversation before this, and I think I'm just going to take that. Now. That's my new title. I am the Kettlebell King's Kettlebell Post. Yeah. Uh, here with Living Dot Fit, and this is the Living Fit Show, and I have my very good friend Dom Fabroni from Dom Fabroni. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dom, DPT. Dr. Dom, P DPT. So Dom is amazing in the content that he provides in just helping people look feel, move better. So I thought, what better person than to talk with us here on Living Fit and just kind of pick his brain on different ways that we can help you look, move, and feel better. And then also, yeah. he's just, I always have a good time talking to Don. We always have a good time. We're always, I never am not smiling or laughing. So I'm going to just be so serious on this, uh, on this interview. But, yeah, uh, I think the real trick will be like staying focused so we can get into any sort of like valuable content. But yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is nice. I mean, we definitely get along well because we just like, we do, we flow in conversation, but we have a very similar mindset on how like we should approach training and how we should approach it for life, whether you use cowbells or whether you use a barbell or whether you just run, whatever the heck it is, you know, how does that fit into your life in a way that you enjoy? Absolutely. I'm, I'm super excited to come on and just talk about some of that. Like, yeah, my background is being a physical therapist, but just the way I've learned and the mentors that I have, like yourself included, the people that I surround myself with have taught me that there's a lot of other things that go into the health of a person other than the yeah. things I just learned in school. So Absolutely. it's really opened up the way that I approach somebody even compared to what a traditional PT might do. So what got you into this? What got you to the point where you wanted to spend the time, spend the money, spend the energy to get your doctorate in that, yeah. but just fitness in general, what, what kind of opened the door? You know, like I always go back to origins because you know, I love looking at where people grew up from and like the early influences in their life and how that continues to perpetuate the decisions that we make in life, right? And I don't think we can discount what what happens early in our life and the family situation we grow up in again different for everybody Absolutely. but if we don't look at that you know we're not gonna have a better understanding of why we might be the way we are now and i just i was very fortunate in the way that my parents taught me about movement and why it's important for our bodies and not just to get to the gym and crush the hour workout but it's important to be able to move through our world and the enjoyable things that we can do with that and so you know i've always come from this very purpose driven understanding of movement and then of course I got into sports and I think that my exercise and the reason I exercise changed a little bit because I think as a man lifting in like football yeah. locker rooms, you always have the pressure to lift the most weight yeah. and look the bulkiest, get have the biggest yeah. six pack, be the leanest. And I think that's a very dangerous mindset if that's where you're completely driven from. Yeah. I do think that there's an importance to being happy with how we look whatever that means to us. Anyone right? that says otherwise, they are full of, you know what, because totally. there is a, it, it's subjective, it's different, but and, everybody again, that doesn't mean you have to have a certain aesthetic. Exactly. That's not connecting it to a certain look. Yeah. So as long as you can be happy with the way you look and the way your body moves and the movement you do to keep it that way, that's kind of what it has evolved to mean for me through, I think, parents that kind of fostered this early understanding of movement. So give me an example of what that, because that's the first time I've ever heard that, where parents really fostered that, like, moving yeah. well throughout your life. Like, I don't even know what that means. My, I get, my yeah. parents and my dad are sleeping on the couch. <laughs> I guess that growing up, I always saw how my mom, and she would speak to us about this stuff, like, her mindset was always the best, and she always felt the healthiest when she was outside. She would always be going on walks or walking the dogs or cross-country skiing. I grew up in Minnesota. like. And people say, like, I don't know how you handle the snow. And it's like, well, I had a fat tire bike that I would go outside in the snow and bike, you know, yeah. bike on trails and stuff when it was snowing outside and cross country sneak skis and snowshoes and stuff. And it's like, when that became my exercise and that's like, and I got to go outside and see this amazing world and yeah, it was a little bit cold, but you keep your fingers, your feet and your face warm, the three F's, <laughs> fingers, feet and face. Oh my gosh. When, you move in the rest of, <laughs> when you're moving, the rest of your body's hot and to be able to come back from an hour workout yeah. where I just got to like snowshoe along the river and I'm sweaty and I'm peeling off all my layers and like that is so much more fulfilling and my body feels so much better and more connected than doing anything <laughs> in a gym, in a gym setting under fluorescent lights and all the other things that come along with being in a gym, which does have its benefits, of yeah, course. Not to discount that, but... <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think that's where I started having the influence from my parents. And then them to just say, no, you're not sitting inside. We had a TV rule, you know. I'm lucky that I was born before the huge TV boom, <laughs> because my or parents had social media boom. Or totally, <laughs> any of that stuff. I didn't have any of that influence when I was young, and that's a blessing because I think that that stuff is 
dangerous in our early development. And that's a whole other rabbit hole we could get down. But so my parents, we had a, a screen time rule and the rest of the time was spent outside or spent doing something that was going to stimulate your mind in a different way. Yeah. So I think that that really reflects on how I like to move now, which I like to be a variable mover. I like to do different things all the time. I variable love, mover. I love training kettlebells with you and doing flow with Venus and doing yoga based things with Jack and handstand stuff with Jen because it's trains my body to be ready for the inevitable inevitable variability life's gonna throw at us, right? Yeah. And so I like to climb trees and just go outside and do things in nature that challenge my body too because it helps me learn to be ready for a variable world movement wise. Yeah. And again, I just get a lot more fulfillment that way. I love that because like you said, you're, you're ready for anything, that variable mover, that's such a fantastic, I've never heard it in that way, even though everyone kind of says they do things differently, but to kind of mm -hmm. compartmentalize it as I'm a variable mover, I mean, you're ready for anything. So totally. you know, for new clients, how do you get them to even embrace that kind of mindset? Because most people are zero movers. So right. to get them to try to move a lot of different ways might not always work. What's your way to kind of get them started? I mean, so, this is a really tough thing for a lot of people because we <laughs> we tend to go through these cycles in life where it's like, okay, I need to start exercising and you go and you go for a little while and then of course we burn out and stop and that maybe we can get a month in or two months in and it's going great and then our body just can't maintain that. So, you know, I talk to people on the premise of building behaviors and so how we find that, that what, you know, what we do has to stem from the why that we just kind of touched on. Like, why are you fueled to move? Yeah. And my ultimate reason that I want to be fueled to move is to fulfill my purpose in life, which is to empower people to independence in their own journey, right? right? So once you find, like, that's my why, to empower people to independence in my journey, I need to know how to move if I want to teach people how to do that. Bar none. So there, there's a good enough reason for me to keep moving, yeah. right? And as long as everything I do comes back around to that, I'm okay with it. You know, I'm okay with how it's teaching me better to teach other people how to master their bodies and the different nuances that yeah. everyone has in their own bodies. So my first sessions with people are 90 minutes long and we spend a good amount of just talking, talking about how they move, talking about what they've done in the past, things that they've enjoyed, because inevitably, no matter how much pain you're in or what your story is or what your journey has been, everyone says, oh, there was this time I was doing this for exercise three times a day and I loved it. And, so much. and if you don't dig into someone's story enough to find those few things that they loved, and that brought their body so much joy through the destruction we do to ourselves when we do exercise, like you need to dig into that. And I, I forever, when I was in PT school, and this is where I'm a little bit more non-traditional, but I think a lot of PTs and providers are just getting there, understanding the importance of talking to somebody yeah. about their journey, because um, I would always get feedback like, oh, you're taking too much time asking questions, you need to get into the treatment, and. A lot of that had to do with billable time, and again, that has to do with the healthcare system, yeah. so a whole new thing, but I started to realize, like, they were saying, oh, no, you're spending too much time on this, and I was like, I think I need to spend more time on that. I think I need to spend more time talking to the person to understand what's important to them so I can ultimately help facilitate that in their life through their movement, through their mindset, and through their meals, which are my three areas I consult with clients on, mindset, movement, and meals, you know, but it all comes from mindset, which is that initial understanding of the purpose. And so I dig in with people on that. And it's really individual, which is tough. I love it. I mean, the mindset is so big. I was just talking with a friend whose mother is just degrading fast. And yeah. it's trying, just telling somebody, I think about that with my own parents or just the older generation, you know, they, they don't want to move. They don't want to do anything. Maybe they'll walk if that, but to try to get them to do something more physical, I love the idea of Okay, well, what is one thing that you enjoyed in the past? And I never even thought about that for someone in their 60s or 70s and just think like, oh, just go move. Like, your life depends on it. For some people, it doesn't matter. No, and for some people, it means to slow down a little bit. So many people are moving in their life too much, <laughs> whether it's moving their mind, moving their mouth, they're moving their body. <laughs> like, we are doing too much and we have too much stimulation. So maybe that one activity is laying down on your back and putting your feet up on a couch and breathing really intentionally to your rib cage for like 20 or 30 minutes. And understanding like when we do that, like if we st suddenly tumble into what breath does for our body, like we can control the balance of our parasympathetic and sympathetic system, like the fight or flight or the rest and digest system. So immediately we start to flip what our nervous system's doing. We start to breathe off carbon dioxide 
or depending on what we're doing, we start to help our body learn how to manage the stress of carbon dioxide. So we play with an oxygen carbon dioxide balance and so many things that our body generally doesn't slow down and do. And a lot of people have come in with years and years of back pain and I just get them on my table laying down and breathing for like 20 or 30 minutes and now they're just like, oh my gosh, like I haven't felt this relaxed or I haven't felt this low of pain or discomfort in my back in so long. And it's 30 minutes of breathing. So what does that movement mean to you and how intentional are you doing as to directing it back into how your body feels? So I think a lot of people run through the world kind of like unconsciously like, everything happening to our body is out of our control and the way that I feel isn't because of what I'm doing, yeah. right? And to some extent, like, it's something that's been growing up, growing for a long time in your body that might just suddenly start to present, but a lot of the times these things come from the environment we surround ourselves in and how that interacts with our body and our genetics and our physiology. Not to discount that we do have a specific code that makes us up, but so how do we keep surrounding ourselves with that slightly better environment to facilitate Back to the why. I'll keep on saying that, right? Back to the why. So what is your main why? I know you want to move better the rest of your life. Yeah. Expand on that. So that's kind of, if anybody's like, where I got the specific content is Simon Sinek. I don't know if you've heard oh, yeah. of him. He's a leadership mm-hmm. development guy and he just had a couple great books and one was Start With Why. So I was like, well, for like mentor gaming, that was one of my first like uh, personal development and emotional intelligence books I read into and I started developing that statement I kind of mentioned it earlier of how do I empower the individual to independence in their journey, right? And I think that's where everything that I do comes from is empowering people to independence. And if we want to dive a little bit deeper into my own story, I really adopted that and was reading this book, Start With Why and The Four Agreements. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh, yeah. Amazing book. That was another one. That was a game changer. That was my foundational. <laughs> that and Start With Why, I developed my own why statement and I started controlling what was in my control and adopting these four agreements. And um, it kind of helped me develop this why of empower yourself to independence in your journey. And that came when I had gotten in a really bad car accident and had some head trauma. And I also played football in college. So I had some (laughs) head trauma throughout eight years of high school and college football and and as a kid. But got this car accident, I was having a lot of post-concussive issues, like memory issues. I was having night terrors and lots of anxiety and just physical anxiety during when I was working with patients. And it's so ironic because I was in a neurologic clinic, (laughs) right? Working with people with head injuries and spinal cord injuries and stuff. And yeah, the thing that brought me back around to that was I started breathing every day, doing breath work, Wim Hof specifically, that was my one that I just like dove in on and journaling. And the journaling is right. a get we totally go down that rabbit hole. That right. is a game, just an incredible game changer. Yeah. So the through the breath work and the journaling and through both of those things, I kind of like returned to spirituality a little bit more. Mm-hmm. In during my breath work, I was saying what I would say are my prayers or sending out the intentions and the, the vibes into the universe, whatever you want to call it, um, to family, friends, and myself and what my body was going through. And just having that like sometimes it'd be 15 minutes of intention a day. I did that for a year. It's like after about a month, all the anxiety was gone and everything was returning to my memory and things started falling back into place. The sleep was better. The night terrors dropped away. And so that really brought me back around to, okay, what's in my control? And if all I have is my breath and my mind, like there's so much that we can do. That's so cool. So what got you into the journaling? Because that one, that's been something I've been yeah. doing. I'm, I found my first journal from like 1999. <laughs> How was it reading through those? Oh, I'm so embarrassing. <laughs> I'm looking at this like, I know you're supposed to write without the intention of ever reading again or anybody right. reading it, but I'm looking at this and I'm like, if I die and people go through my journals, <laughs> they will think, oh, who the parents as you know what. But it was good to see, you know, a, a snapshot into the mind of a you yeah. know, 19 year old me. And uh, it was uh, a little disheartening in some ways where I would see that I had put some goals on there, but mm-hmm. I'm like, 15 plus years later, I still have some of those goals. I'm like, wait, was that even a goal? Did I really care about that? Like, what yeah. was it? But what got you into that? What got you into starting a journal yeah. and thinking that it was going to be something that would help uh, be helpful? That's a cool thing. The journal and the goals you mentioned, I think that that plays in a little bit to that, but like the prospect of journaling in general. You know, a lot of people talk about manifestation and like yeah. what what is the purpose of your journaling and I to, to be yeah. honest I believe in manifestation I just think it comes from a really deeply rooted like neurologic thing <laughs> that the more we're saying something the more we're writing something down the more we're initially my journaling came from, to answer your question came from my memory thing 
I wasn't remembering things. Mm. And so I would do my breath work and right after my breath work in the morning, I would write down everything that happened the previous day, every person I interacted with and just try to do like a series of events as much as I could. And that for me, like after a few months of doing that, I was, I was just remembering people's names more. I was like, so putting some attention to recalling what happened the previous day, either right before I went to bed or right after I woke up, which are vital times for like memory storage and whatnot, yeah. I think were really helpful in helping me overcome some of my um, concussive symptoms and just help me learn really how to like mindfully reflect a little bit better. What makes the morning and the evening time? Because I've heard that multiple times in terms yeah. of, I mean, I've gone through so many different courses and they talk about affirmations and yeah. it's always right in that kind of uh, twilight time when you first wake up and then is again when you, uh, you go to sleep. So what's the importance of those times? So this comes from <laughs> mostly just like me and how I think about it. Um, so you can discredit this if you have a better <laughs> scientific approach. Or you can try it and it won't change either way. But when we wake up in the morning, there's a certain like switch neurologically that flips for us and a bunch of processes start, right? And that's where I think a lot of people talk about morning routines or night, you know, down regulation routines as well, because it's the way to help get our nervous system and physiology back in its kind of natural rhythms after we throw all the crap of the day at it, right? So I say, when it comes to our nervous system and physiology in the morning, we have the opportunity to set the slate and then we go through all the crap of the day and it might throw us off that path that we initially started. And then at the end of the day, we can clean the slate. So when we do these things like journaling, gratitudes, affirmations, and breath work that have been shown to have pretty profound physiologic effect on our body, and we do that at the beginning of the, you know, in the morning and at the end of the night, like we are just kind of cementing this rhythm that our nervous system is going to get in. So it really helps us get into the different, whether it's just a circadian rhythm of the day or your, when your body's hungry and your satiation, like if you start eating at certain times, that can play a role. So there's so many, I think, benefits to developing consistent behavioral patterns using morning and night because we're kind of like habitual beings. Mm -hmm. So if your one thing's a journal, and you want to go for the lowest possible thing, I always just tell people you can do one thing. You can do three gratitudes, write down your three gratitudes. That's like a one minute thing that you can do in the morning, or you could. My prompt I love to give my clients is how do you feel today and why? And you're specifically thinking about it from that approach of what did I eat? Like what I eat, how did I move and where's my mindset been? Yeah. Right. So my mindset includes sleep and anything with the stress system, you know, social media, working on computers, all that stuff, work stress, social stress. So how do I feel today and why? What's going on in life? And if we just take two, three, five minutes to reflect on that, we start pointing out so many things that are the solutions that we tend to look for elsewhere. <laughs> we really know what's going on in our own life. We just tend to not sit down and take the time to reflect. So morning and night is a great time to kind of <laughs> pedal back if you're at the end of the day or in the morning set the intention to be like, this is how I'm going to get through my day. And I'm going to approach it with this kind of attitude and blah, blah, blah. You're that much more likely to come back to that neurologic place. If you kind of set that intention and given your system a baseline, right? I love that. I love that you, you ask your client that so that yeah. they can see not only how they feel right then, because feelings are fleeting, doesn't mean that's the way you have to feel the rest of the day, but it's also the result of what happened the previous day or the previous few days. So to be able to kind of find those, gaps and what's happening as opposed to like, I don't know why I feel like crap as they're yeah. downing soda or downing chips or totally. whatever. And so it gives that benefit, empowers the hell out of them. And it starts to help you also take ownership over like the positive things that start happening in your life. Like, oh, I'm feeling great today. And I took my warm bath at the end of the day and I did some breath work before I went down and journaled a little bit and I slept great. And then and you start to be able to put that together also that when you feel great, it usually is a result of the things you do and the environment you surround yourself with, the environment being the people, the places, the are you outdoors, are you inside, everything, right? So how do you stack up your actions with an amazing environment to get our machine, our body to respond in a certain way? So how do you combat that with clients who maybe they can't really change their environment? Maybe they're in yeah. a relationship they can't get out of or they're in a place that they can't get out of. How would you be able to kind of help them get past that? Yeah, and that's where I think that me as a PT or you as a coach or you know anybody else as a, as a coach, our next skill is kind of deciphering and being um, 
autistic Dr. Seuss, something like that. Something. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, being Dr. Seuss. A little Dr. Seuss, a little Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> one fish, two fish, and then you got the red fish, blue fish, and then by the thing, your life is fixed. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, and like deciphering how something fits in that environment. Yeah. And what is it right now? I mean, if you're in a relationship, you can't get out of it. I think that there's, I'm not the best person to talk to, but I can direct you into you know, I think you should maybe talk to somebody else about this or, you know, what can you do to stimulate conversations like and an understanding or if you're in an environment like a work situation where you're, I'm stuck here, I've got to answer emails and I've got to be on calls, like there's always opportunities for movements. You know, I have my 30 for 30 rule with people that this is like something for the desk if you're a sedentary worker, if you work at a desk and you're always on the phone and the computer, 30 seconds every 30 minutes, you should move your body in the opposite position that you're in for yeah. that 30 minutes, right? right? So if you're in a hip flex position, shoulders slightly forward, we're internally rotated, you know, here, head forward and stuff, we should reverse that all for at least 30 seconds. Yeah. So stand up, you know, <sighs> extend your hips fully. Get out of the camera. Yeah. Get out of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we party. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I'll do this. Yes. <laughs> Stand around. Yeah. Now I'm gonna cut that out. Extend, yeah. extend the hips, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Reverse everything out because yeah. People say like, oh, I'm sitting for eight hours a day. Like, do you have to be for all eight of those hours? And if it's just like 10 minutes that we're intentionally like activating different muscles, activating the hips, activating the shoulders and stuff, then so much more beneficial to that message we keep on kind of printing into the system rather than only giving it this all day, right? So there's always ways you can adjust your environment a little. If you're on the phone, can you lay on your back with your feet up and, you know, yeah. Get your body a little more comfortable while you're talking on the phone or what it might be weird, but if you're in an office, if you're, you have your own door and stuff, you can do some kind of weird things in your office. Walk in place. Make your body feel weird. <laughs> yeah, stand up, walk in place, walk around your office. So there's always those little things that we can, that's in that first session when we're talking about things, it's like you start to pull up. Oh, do you have to always be sitting or can you just walk up the stairs, you know, yeah. to get to the third floor and things like that. There's, there's those unique little things. And then also how do we fit exercise into that is... What a lot of people's question is. So what's your take? Let's just go in a totally different direction. Where do, do you see the fitness world right now? Give me some of the things that you mm. think are just terrible about the fitness world. Oh. We're going shit talk right now. I was, I was going to yeah. keep it all positive. You're so positive, bro. I want to I love shit talking. I want to hear it. I love shit talking. So here's my line that I always use. Like we live in a same pig, different blanket kind of world. And we live in a world where so many if you really want me to get rough on people where so many people like come out with their fancy new thing with their thing oh I have this special tool that I rub on your leg and it does something different than all those other tools that people rub on legs and like the thing that you have come up with isn't special <laughs> there are millions and millions of people in this world coming up with techniques and coming up with movement strategies and stuff that just influence our nervous system and influence our body in a certain way so whether you do it through you know FRC or PNF patterns or, you know, different techniques that essentially help you do a lot of the same things. The people who wrote the technique might just be coming at it from a slightly different underlying principle, right? Yeah. And that doesn't mean that there's not value in certifications. There's so much value in certifications to teach people foundations and to teach people principles and the structure to go by. But a world likes structures and a world likes structures too much. And then you get into these clubs of, okay, let's, you know, is it, is it FRC or is it this, or is it kettlebells? Should we be using kettlebells? Should we be using barbells? That's where I go back to me. Like I like to be a variable mover, right? And I like to do something that is going to teach me a lot of different ways of one, understanding something. I don't think there's anything wrong with any specific technique. I think there's something wrong with a person who think that that's the fix for everyone. Right? Yeah. And so, whatever your certification is, wherever you found your tribe that taught you about this importance of understanding our body a little better, you can have immense gratitude and you can want to push that because that's where you found that. But I promise you that there's a lot of other things in the world people are going to respond well to. And that's where I encourage people to like mostly just try and learn from each other rather than ever tearing people down for things, ask questions to understand rather than accusing people of something you might not completely know about them. So I think, I feel like people just get way too siloed off. And that's, I think, my main message and my main, you know, disgust about the fitness and the healthcare system is that people are way too siloed off. And the unfortunate thing, it's within that silo that we make our money. <laughs> and so if you're not doing well, or if you're not pushing your product and your group's not doing well, then you might not be making the money or you might not be getting the traffic or the extra, you know, accolades that you need to get. So 
it's unfortunate because then, kind of like in sports, we just pit ourselves against each other and think we're taking a bigger part of the pie when really health is an infinite space that we need to be much more collaborative in and help people find the thing that is going to help them. <laughs> You're going to help hundreds of people. I'm going to help some people that you might not be able to reach and vice versa. So it's just like, if we can be more collaborative, which is why I love the group. I love, love knowing you well and some of the people we know because we will just pass each other patients and clients readily and there's yeah. never this understanding that you're taking this person for me or whatever like the more we all work together the more we build a community and when people feel that sense of community that's going to help them live longer than the exercise does you yeah. know so again coming back around to the purpose and feeling like you have a place in this society and community is much more important within that movement so i think that's why people get so attached to their community but that's one of my biggest complaints is that that makes you not as open to yeah. Studying other things. Try different <laughs> things right. to be able to, like you said, you might have a client that you might not be able to help 100%. If you're able to give them somebody or yeah. so even if something in the same area, that might be able to help them a little bit better. But yeah. everyone gets so, you know, territorial about their information, which, first off, nobody invented anything new. Like, and yeah. it's, <laughs> it's amazing to be like, this is novel system. No, it's just a new perspective. And this is what totally. I teach in courses. I'm not giving you this dogmatic, this is the way to do it. I'm giving you a framework that's worked for me based on my experience and based on what I've done with other people. So yeah. not just being like, this is the only way, do this, F that person, that person, mm -hmm. it's those people that we have to say, like, let's let's keep them and yeah. distance ourselves from them. That's what a lot of times I say, that's fine, leave them, saddle it off, and once you're open to discussing something other than your brilliant technique, we'll be here and we're ready to talk. <laughs> it's just um, like, so it's, this win-win that people can't, so yeah, they, they think that they're getting a bigger piece of the pie, like you said. Then, so yeah. no, it's just you're making a smaller pie that you're getting now. I mean, how many tools do you see that, like the little, the guns that have the, the rapid percussion? Like, how many different companies need to come out with a different one and, and think they made a new gun? That's really the same thing that a lot of people like, and it's okay that a lot of people like rapid vibration and percussion. Like, go ahead and use them, but <laughs> don't try to say that you made something new. And, yeah, you could have. I don't know. Again, same thing, different blanket. So there we go. <laughs> Well, that's actually your biggest complaint. What's your what's the what's the thing you love about the fitness industry right now? Where it's at? Yeah, I love um, recently. <laughs> so I think a positive con consequence of what's going on in the world right now with a lot of people needing to be inside and us not even be able to meet in person as much is that it is rapidly helping us construct systems that we can maybe deliver this information online and we can have this community now online. Yeah. So. Opposed to what we just talked about with people siloing themselves off, I think our you know, ability to start doing so much more online and so much more collaboratively is increasing, which is amazing. Yeah. And you know, from trainers to lower level providers to people like PTs and Kairos to MDs, like, I think we're finding those paths on how to knit that system up. So from the MDs to the PTs to the trainers and everyone in between, we're creating this more continuous system of health. And I think that once we create the online system that we can reach rural areas, maybe a little bit easier that might not have access to stuff. So what I'm seeing and liking a lot um, is people learning to put all this information out online and collaborate with others. That's really cool. Yeah. And that is the, that is the good thing about social media. It's the great thing about social media is being able to connect yeah. with people that you never would have connected with. You know, meet people that you never totally. would have met and help people that you would never see because these are people in different countries. These are people with less than optimal means. They're not going to be able to fly out to you, but now yeah. they can find your information. I mean, I just in the last year have kind of like, by a year and a half, have kind of come more into this online medium of putting information out online. And it's been amazing because the things that you start sharing about yourself or you feel like you're being vulnerable or whatever, and the same coined as vulnerability or weaknesses or whatever, like, I had those concussive issues that I mentioned earlier. And that doesn't go away when I get fatigued and when I don't have a lot of sleep and if I drank a little, <laughs> a little too many drinks the night before or something, like I can tell that my brain doesn't catch up as fast as it you know, used to, especially since that last hit. But since like putting more of that stuff out and through the community, I found so many people online that are dealing with post-concussive stuff or creating post-concussive courses and are wanting to like collaborate and have you on and talk about your story. So. When you're online and you share those things, there's an opportunity for so many more people to see it to then grow your own healing community. So if you aren't into putting yourself out there online or if you're afraid of trolls, one, trolls are hard, but they're not worth any time or space. 
still need it, block it. And it, it's okay to be sad about something somebody says and then detach from it and understand it's coming from their own pain. <laughs> and, and that that's not you. And so that's a whole other topic. And I'm sure you could talk about your hand troubles all day long. <laughs> There's so much fun. I actually have a lot of fun with them. It doesn't happen often enough, but it is fun. I, just, I, I find the right emoji, I find the right thing to say. It's just, it can be fun. But. Totally. And then that's the energy you take from it. Um, you know, hopefully that comes out for them and they can have a laugh or something. But again, it probably deters them in the future because they understand, like, I'm going to be me and I'm going to put out this information because yeah, I know I'm helping changing. a lot of people. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm sorry something triggered you, but that's that. The point I was getting at is that once you start putting that stuff out there, someone's going to see it. Someone's going to be like, Hey, me too. <laughs> you know, Hey, I'm going through that just like you are right now and comment out. And I've met people that continue to reconnect with me and being like, Hey, this is awesome to hear. Keep it up. And so you get that encouragement online, find that community that some of us are missing right now. And, um, usually it just comes from being genuine and trying to shut out the noise because there's always going to be that. So awesome. So you've already, you've talked multiple times about what living fit means to you, but we like to end these with that kind of, with a very, uh, fairly quick synopsis, like what does living fit mean to you? Yeah. So living fit to me means in the three areas, of mindset, movement, and meals, understanding how to knit those together and eat and fuel our machine optimally so that we can move well to fulfill our purpose throughout life. And that to me is living well in a nutshell. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that was incredibly inspiring. It's going to make me go back and burn a couple old journals, but really start journaling a little bit more. <laughs> and uh, I love that message, and I hope you got something from that. And even if, you know, for yourself, but for someone you love or someone you know, that will be able to benefit from that. So where can we find more information about you? Um, right now, I'm mostly on Instagram at Dr. Dom, D-P-T, D-R-D-O-M, D-P-T. Um, me and my fiance have a podcast, the Optimal Body Podcast. We have a lot of conversations like this. We definitely need to have you on, of course. Um, but yeah, a lot of it's just genuine people talking about their story. And then there are also some amazing experts in health, so they can give us some, some tidbits there. Uh, so yeah, we're putting a lot of two episodes out a week on that. Um, and it's otherwise, an awesome show. Thank you. So yeah. much good information, such quality information, both of you guys. Totally. And we're just so lucky to have a lot of people that we want to have on. And it's like, people keep coming to us and it's like, hey, you looking for any other people to interview? We're like, no, sorry, we have so many amazing people that are surrounding us that we got to get through first and that we're blessed to have around us. Um, last thing I'd say is I work for a company, The Mobility Method, um, which my fiance, Jen Iscare, created amazing programs there to help your body explore mobility, learn a bit, a bit about yourself and work through some barriers your body might have. Awesome. Well, that's where you can find out information. You can feel better, you can look better, you can move better, all the ways oh, to, yeah. to feel amazing. So thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your energy. Always a good time. So until next time.